Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we explore the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. In this, our fourth season, we're looking at Kenneth Branagh's 2011 film, Thor. I'm Matthew Fox from TheEthicalPanda.com. And I'm Andy Nelson from TheNextReel.com. And today in this special hyenas episode, we're talking about the Marvel one-shot, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to Thor's Hammer. All sin is driving, thieves are conniving. Something for all you fans, a one-shot tonight. In this gas station, he uses evasion. Fakes out the robbers in this one-shot tonight. No Captain, no Thor, no Hulk with his roar. But here we learn Coulson's not a bore. MCU's expanding, Feige commanding. Here we see Coulson in a fight. Thor minute tomorrow, one-shot tonight. Uh, having made the musical reference that the title does, uh, I want to introduce our guest, uh, Pete Wright, which is kind of funny because I'm the new person on this podcast, introducing Pete, who's been a central <laughs> part of it from the beginning. Uh, Pete told me he didn't have a title, so I'm going to call him the Engineer Isimo of the <laughs> Next Real podcast. Uh, Pete, how are you doing today? I aspire to be called Isimo anything. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh, this is great. I'm very excited to be here. I, I'm very excited for this particular one shot. And, and this very well may be my only uh, exposure to Thor with you all. So mostly I'm just excited to be able to be on your team for this brief moment. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we have to uh, ring, ring every uh, last drop of it we can out of you then. Uh, and we're going to talk to you uh, in listener land about all the awesome things about this one shot. And there's so much you can get out of not just this podcast, but also being a member. And take it away, Andy, to tell them all about membership. That's right. Yeah, we are an independent podcast from True Story FM. We really, really love producing the show and just talking Thor. And we love having talked about Iron Man 2, The Incredible Hulk, the first Iron Man movie. Uh, just geeking out about all of this stuff. But it does take time, cost money. Without our members, for whom we are very, very grateful, we just couldn't keep going. So membership really helps us deliver the content to you without having to sell your information and your interest through podcast advertising sources. We like our privacy, and we know you do too. If you're already a member, thank you so much. If you're not, please consider becoming a member for the season. It only costs $5 a month, or we do offer a discounted price if you join at the annual rate. You will get bonus episodes, early access to shows, access to live streams, stickers, and more. Plus, you get the comfort of knowing that you are supporting this independent podcast production. Just visit truestory.fm slash Marvel Movie Minute to learn more. Thank you. So let's dive in. And uh, for anyone who's wondering why in the world I was singing at the beginning, the, the title of this one shot, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to Thor's Hammer, is clearly a reference to a great Broadway musical that uh, Zero Mostel did a great performance of in a movie of a long time ago, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. So, uh, and from the, uh, if you ever heard the song, Tragedy Tomorrow, Comedy Tonight, that's what that's from. Uh, but before we even get into this specific one shot, let's Let's step back a little bit, because some folks might be listening and going, wait, what in the world is a one-shot? Where did this come from? So, uh, Andy, what what are these one-shots? Where where did they start popping up in Marvel, and what's what's the context for them? And this one specifically. Yeah, it's funny. They, they started when Thor was released on uh, DVD and Blu-ray. There was a one-shot, and, and it's kind of just a short film that's kind of like... I mean, kind of like what Kyle was saying last season. Meanwhile, in the MCU, it's just another little fun story of kind of a, a side story, really. What else could be happening in kind of the world of the MCU? Not necessarily focusing on the main characters. It's just kind of a, a side story. And and they started releasing these uh, with the release of Thor. What's interesting about it, though, is this particular one we're talking about was not the one that actually got released with the Thor, uh, the Thor release, the this one came out on the Captain America DVD and Blu-ray. The one that was released with the Thor disc was called The Consultant, which we we decided to shift that one to the end of this season because it kind of doesn't necessarily happen at this particular point. Whereas a funny thing happened on the way to Thor's Hammer, as we'll discuss, really happens right at this exact time, right as kind of like Iron Man 2 and... Thor are hitting this kind of crossing point. So that's why we did that shift. Yeah, to some extent, you could say this takes place during the credits of Iron Man 2, because if you remember in Iron Man 2, 
partway through the movie, Coulson has to leave because of something that's happened that he has to go investigate. And of course, the end credits are Coulson arriving at the thing that he's come to investigate, which we find is Mjolnir. And this is all about, as the title says, a small little vignette of what happens to him on his way. And I I, I love I, I love this, and I love the fact that all the one shots exist, and the fact that they existed this far back. Because to me, and we'll talk about this one especially, they really help provide kind of some connective tissue between the different movies. You know, at, at this point, it was still just standalones. We hadn't even had Avengers yet, and and this one about kind of a side character who's popped up so far in all of them. Um, is he? I forget. Is is Coulson in Hulk? He is not in Hulk, but he appeared in the two Iron Man movies. So it provide he provides kind of some connective tissue of like connecting that part of the MCU to this new one that's happening, and I, I just they're fantastic. Yeah, they're they're a lot of fun. I, I think it's really fun to look at. And I just, you know, listening to um, to the guys wrap up last season on Iron Man 2, you know, there's this whole sequence at the end of Iron Man 2 where they're where Fury and, and uh, uh, Tony are having this conversation about, you know, whether Tony is is the right sort of material for the Avengers initiative. And there are there's this map on the table in the or on the on the wall. And it's it's pointing out all these places all the way to, you know, Wakanda and some random place in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And these are nods that have heretofore been been fleshed out across the cinematic universe. And so I, I think Coulson is like he's like that dot. Right. You you see only in hindsight that he was a lenticular photograph that shows you the way all of these things tie together in, in a really unique way and giving him, you know, his first sort of demonstration that he's also he's not just a nebishy agent he is also kind of an action hero like he he can solve physical problems too as well as dare i say logistics challenges and i think that's one of the things i like most about this and that we'll get to because i know andy as you and i get more into thor one of the things that i'm really struck by re-watching it is that Shield plays a very different role in Thor than it has in the first two Iron Man movies, and and so does Coulson. And this movie is a nice introduction of you know that as you were saying, Pete, he's not just quite the nebbishy guy, and that Shield aren't quite the that they come across a little bit bumbling somewhat in the Iron Man movies. And so this is a yeah. fun kind of oh yeah no this this is a different side of a our dear favorite agent. It's all a work in progress. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, and it's it is a lot of fun to kind of see this more serious side of Coulson that we definitely get in this short, giving us a sense that he is kind of, I mean, he's an agent. And when you think of agents, I mean, yes, there are the desk jockey type of agents, but you also think of the ones who are out in the field and actively taking down uh, the villains and stuff. And and so giving Coulson an opportunity to kind of do something that shakes things up a little bit, I think is great. And uh, especially because, I mean, yeah, and and you're right, we haven't uh, we'll be talking about him as we kind of start talking about Thor. But uh, I mean, so far, he has been much more of just kind of the assistant. And when we get into Thor, I mean, he still is the guy I mean, he's going out and, and examining things. But if you think about the context of Thor, I mean, Iron Man, yeah, it's 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 a, a, a weapons manufacturer who is a, a you know, multimillionaire who designs a suit and now he's flying around fighting crime. But in Thor, the context is all of a sudden there's an alien presence, essentially, I guess is how you'd think that they're looking at it, right? An alien presence that is kind of coming to Earth. And yeah, very much, I think that S.H.I.E.L.D. is coming to say, you know, is this a threat? And right. and because it very well could be. And the nice thing about what we're getting here is the sense that Coulson could handle himself if things actually do turn south. Yeah, he's he's not just an investigator. Right. Yeah. He's just not a not just a detective. Uh, one other little fun note about this one before we start diving into it. This is to date, at least at the time of the, the research I was doing, the only live action property that the MCU has put out that does not feature a single character who ever appeared in comics. Colt, I believe Agent Coulson has now appeared in comics uh, right. going forward, but he was a creation of the MCU. And I mean, granted, there's only four characters and, you know, three of them never even get names. So it's a kind of low bar. But this is, as far as I understand it, the only live action of any kind the MCU's ever done where not a single character had appeared in comics first. Just a fun little thing to think about as we go forward with this. Yeah, absolutely. So we start with this kind of opening shot. We're driving through the desert. It's a, it's a little montage. We're driving through it day and night. 
have to remember that he's coming from L.A., so he's going from L.A. to New Mexico. Uh, I am not a West Coaster, but I know you all are. Let's talk about the road he's going down. Well, I just have to talk about this a little bit because if if he is, because we, we see a mileage sign, right? We see how many miles. We should just say, as you start this, Andy went to a very dark place about roads and mileage. <laughs> I, I, I may have spent a little too deep of a rabbit hole dive going, uh, d- exploring the mileage and, and where he's coming from and where he's going. I, I was a bit surprised seeing all the notes here, but anytime you have me on for a <laughs> something set in New York City where people are using the subway to get around, trust me, I yeah. will have notes. <laughs> You'll be doing so the exact same thing. This is 100% thing. That's legit right. as I see it. Well, the, the sign we see says Gallup is 182 miles away, Albuquerque is 304 miles away, and Puente Antiguo, which we certainly will be talking about a lot, over the course of the movie Thor is 473 miles away. So if we're at a point where Gallup, uh, New Mexico, is 182 miles away and he's coming from L.A., the obvious path is to be taking the uh, Interstate 40 across uh, across the country, going from California into Arizona into New Mexico. And if he's 182 miles from Gallup, that likely means he's in Arizona. He's past Flagstaff, past Winona. He's on, a, on his way to Winslow. Anyone who's familiar with uh, the old Route 66 is familiar with the names of those towns. Um, but I'm just thinking about standing on a corner so, in Winslow, exactly. Arizona. But yes, yeah. also, I get exactly. You. There you go. Uh, but if he's on, if he I mean, if he's really going from L.A. to to New Mexico, he's on the interstate, as I said. And these roads that we're seeing him driving on are definitely not I-40. So I just want to mm-hmm. make sure that everyone knows. Yeah. So maybe he's just taking the back roads. I don't know. But anyway, he passes this sign. And, you know, it's, I mean, the mileage is a little bit off as far as between Gallup and Albuquerque, but it's pretty close. But once he gets to Albuquerque, that means he has about 169 miles to get to Puento Antiguo. Now, I can't imagine he's driving into northern New Mexico because it's much more mountainous and it's not going to kind of feel like the same look that we're getting um, if he's driving kind of toward where the, the the actual set of Puento Antiguo was filmed, which, again, we'll certainly talk about that um, in the show, um, he's only going about half the distance. So that doesn't make sense. So, you know, again, it's a fictional place, so they're making it up. So if you head south on I-25 from Albuquerque, I mean, maybe Puento Antiguo is somewhere between Truth or Consequences, New Mexico and Las Cruces. Could be. Or it could almost be to Roswell, New Mexico. Weirdly, that seems like it could be making sense in some strange uh, kind of way. Um, and also, if you stay on the 40, you could almost hit Tucumcari. So somewhere in that circumference is likely where uh, the story of uh, Thor in Puento Antiguo is happening. I'm not sure that the writers went to that level of detail uh, that we just did, but I think it's entirely possible. And I kind of love the idea that they're kind of implying that maybe the Bifrost opens here from time to time, and that's where Roswell comes from. You know, that could be a fun little that's, connection to things as well. That's what I was wondering. I'm like, I wonder if the the production designers, when they were coming up with the sign, were just playing around with that as a possibility, because that's one mm-hmm. of the things that could make sense. Well, and and because that last, like the the closing scene of Iron Man 2 when he's standing on the lip of that, it, it almost looks like a quarry, but it really could be closer to that truth or consequences, like v- giant valley kind of, you know, they, 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 they could be trying to sell us on, on the fact that we're in a little bit more mountainous terrain. And it's possible. I mean, I mean, there are mountains, but I mean, there are mountains all through this area. So it's entirely yeah, possible yeah. we're still seeing the mountains. But I mean, if you go farther, if you go 170 miles north of Albuquerque, I mean, you're up in mountains. It's not going to you are. Yeah, it's right. not going to be mountains. the desert yeah. that we're seeing in the movie. Right. right. That makes sense. Uh, okay, and so he's driving along. We're hearing this great music uh, that I kind of describe as like 60s spy music. It, it's a tune that I feel like I've heard a million times before, but I, I looked into the credits and it said that it was by Paul Oakenfold. Mm-hmm. Is he just doing kind of a riff on something that we've all heard before? Yeah, or is it's that... Benny, Benny Goodman's Sing, Sing, Sing with a Swing That's uh, what that I he's thought. doing okay, a riff. Yeah, yeah and, and it's it's a, a wonderful rendition. They actually call it the Marvel Swing, and uh, we can put a link in the show notes to the to a YouTube version of the with of the full song, which is right. um, I love it. I think it's great. So fun. Because to me, it gives a kind of secret agent, but like an old fashioned kind, yeah, you know, yeah. it, it not even James Bond, but more like um, 
yeah, other kind of like, you know, gets not even get, get smart. That's more parody. But, uh, well, huh, I don't even know. I don't I think this, this is a pure coincidence. But the first thing I thought of is the old British spy show, The Avengers. Oh, yes. right, um, right, but, right. You know, that right, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and it's, it's very much like Agent Carter era. Right. Yeah. And right. so it ties into a TV property that hasn't come out yet. So, yeah. But very old fashioned. Yeah. Yeah. My sense is that it feels like Peter Gunn, which I mean, it's kind of that that same sort of vibe of the da, 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 like the very 60s mm-hmm. swing spy music, which is definitely yep. a big thing. So as he's going along, he uh, he eventually pulls into a gas station and we see that he's driving an Acura, the first of many product placements we'll be getting in these uh, two and a half minutes. And he pulls up to a Roxxon gas station. Uh, and Roxxon. Roxxon is a company that we are going to we've seen quite a bit in the MCU, and we're also going to continue seeing. It's also very big in the comics, I know. Yep. Uh, they, they, they've already spot, Roxxon sponsored a car at the Monaco races that we saw in the first Iron Man movie yep. when Tony and... Iron Monger. Iron, Iron Monger, thank yep. you, are fighting. I believe they're, they're fighting outside a Roxxon building of some yep. kind. Yep. Yep. And of course, it's going to go on to be mentioned again and again and again. Uh, the oil platform that the destruction of is a major part of the cloak and dagger story, which is a kind of unknown MCU product, but one I really love. That's Roxxon. In, in fact, given that, I think you could say, Matthew, like Roxxon's role in the in the Marvel universe has been pretty dramatically undersold in the oh, Marvel yeah. Cinematic Universe. Like it's only really been hinted at with signs and stuff, but it's it's a sinister organization. Right. Very much so. And my, my personal favorite reference to it is that uh, my personal favorite lawyers in the MCU, Matt Murdock and yep. Foggy Nelson, when they are at Landman and Zach and they are interning, they have a client that one of the cases that sort of most bothers them and they think about as the the reason they left Landman and Zach is because they were representing them. Uh, Landman and Zach was representing Roxxon for an oil spill. So yep, yep. just kind of a really fun little tie in that they that they showed us Roxxon there. Uh, yeah, it's great. Uh, I also couldn't help but notice that gas was three dollars and seventy nine cents. And I remembered being in California in the uh mid to late 2000s and paying quite a lot for gas. And, uh, you know, that's it's now, as we're recording, it's kind of creeping back to 250 260 but reminding me of a time when it was almost $4. So that was a nice little moment in time there. What's what's really funny is I'm checking the gas price in Oregon where I am podcasting from now, and it is three seventy nine. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Oh, funny. Well, And there's just one little moment here that this is all about establishing how cool and how badass and how, like, you should feel safe around this guy Agent Coulson is. So I have one very big bone to pick with the man. Uh Oh. (laughs) Because, granted, I grew up in New York City, so I didn't grow up around car culture. But I did learn cars when I moved out. I learned to drive. I learned car safety. And I think one of the first things I was taught is that once you put the gas into your car and it's fueling, Walking away into the gas station while the fuel is being pumped is very, very bad. <laughs> that is so funny and yet, because, like, that's exactly you, yeah. what he does. But it's so funny because that's exactly what. Like, I grew up in Colorado, and we always did this. Like, you put really? the thing in, you push start, you lock your car, and you go to the bathroom or you go get a stick. As, as, long, as, okay. as long as the car's not running, yeah, that was always yeah. the thing I was told. As long as the car's not running. You're good, but don't walk away from it if they or don't even you shouldn't even fuel while the car car is running. Okay, well I'm I, I'm never taking a ride with either one either one of you. Then, but I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've never seen that, but I guess that you know if that's kind of the older you know the thing that used to be done, then I guess it could fit Agent Coulson being kind of you know old fashioned. And... I think Matthew just called us old. I think so. What well, do it's funny what because do do like that? for me, like I think I'm older than Andy. So <laughs> oh, well, I guess we'll have to compare ages. <laughs> off air. <laughs> yeah. what, well, what I think is funny is like for from my mentality, you always re- learned like don't gas up and or don't start fueling and then walk away less because of safety and more because somebody and I've never seen this happen. So I don't know if it's just something your parents would tell you, but somebody could take your gas pump out and fill up their own car while you're not paying attention and then put their put the gas back into yours before you come back out huh. and then your gas ends up costing like you know two times as much because you know you you filled two tanks that was that was really why i was said to just be careful of that well i've seen it in movies for sure i've never seen that in all of my life i've never even heard that 
that that happens. And now I feel like I have yeah. been, I've risked my own credit card by, <laughs> I, I, by I, I've, never, I've never seen that happen or even thought of that. But I will say that I have learned that you do all what you can never, ever, ever do the thing of go into the store, you know, buy some drinks and some donuts and then say, you know, and also put $20 on pump two. Yeah. Because what I've done at least a half dozen times, unfortunately, till I finally lost my lesson, is go in, use the restroom, buy the sodas and the donuts, ask them to put $20 on pump two, say thank you very much, pay, get in my car, drive away. And then realize that someone's about to pull up and get $20 of free gas mm. because I'm an idiot. <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway, okay, so we're still deep. Let's pull us back to not quite being on, yes. on so much of a tangent mode. Well, I do what I have one tangent, and I just want to say how nostalgically wonderful it is to watch this and and be able to think about so many years with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., in which oh, Coulson yes, drove a true. 1962 Corvette named Lola. Right. Uh, I think it was the, like, levitating over land automobile, I, I mm-hmm. think it stood for. And uh, I just, he is, he here, I know product placement Acura, but this is where he starts earning enough c- cool credibility to earn that car. <laughs> and right. I love it. I just, I love it. Yeah, and my impression was always that he doesn't really get the car until he goes to Tahiti, which is a magical yep. place. But, you know, we'll we'll, we'll see that. Yeah. Certainly, though, we see that as, as badass he is, as awesome as he is, he's also kind of indecisive when faced with the choice of powdered donuts or frosted donuts. Little <laughs> Debbie, of course. Let me put it to both of you. Powdered donuts or frosted? Chocolate frosted, specifically. There was no question watching Coulson that it would be chocolate because <laughs> only one reason. He's wearing a gray suit. Also very, very true. Those powdered donuts are messy. Everywhere. Except, uh, they explode. I, I'm great at Except eating powdered I, donuts. I'd, I'd pick those and I would nary get a drop of, of powdered sugar anywhere. I call you to task, sir. <laughs> I would like to see that. Well, I mean, and as I think about it, Pete, like if we're all establishing how badass and cool he is, how great would it have been just to show him like, Opening the powdered donuts just as he's getting started and then pulling off the road like 10 hours later and there's nothing on his suit. And you're just like, how did you do that? You know, he actually eats donuts like Diana in the original V. He just like distends his jaw and they go straight down his throat. That's how he does it. Original Original V, you're taking me back. I love that show. (laughs) Now I'm having flashbacks to that. Anyway, so. And we do get a little more uh, product placement here because we kind of see Blurry. First of all, Little Debbie specifically. Mm-hmm. And we see kind of Blurry in the fridge behind. We can see 7-Up, Ginger Ale, uh, what distinctly looks like Gatorade bottle shapes. And then, of course, our plot really starts when a couple of robbers enter. And it's two white guys. Uh, they look kind of, you know, scummy people, clearly not here to do good things. They have shotguns. And they say, you know, your money. And, you know, demanding to the, the pretty young lady who's working behind the counter. And the, one of the first things they ask is, who owns the car outside? And calm as a cucumber, Colson just says, oh, I do, but it, it's more of, more of a lease. <laughs> Such a good so, line. <laughs> that is so Colson. Like, we were, we're going to get mm-hmm. so much more of this type of dialogue from Colson over the years, and I just love it. It what's make it's what makes him such an easy joy to add to the Marvel comic universe, right? Because they made a character that's just so easy to be cool, and yeah. uh, I, I just think, think he earns every every bit of it. Yeah, and I think one of the things I like most about him, and this line captures it so well, is he comes off at first as kind of a fuddy duddy. Yeah, and a lot of his humor is this kind of. <laughs> Making fun of someone by answering their question literally, you know, like, who owns yeah. the car? Oh, you know, it, it's, it's a lease. Like, clearly that doesn't matter in the slightest. <laughs> right. And the way he does it, you all, I always get the sense that the characters around him are never actually 100 percent sure. It, it, does he actually think that they wanted the literal answer or is he making fun of them? And there's just such it's such a hard line to walk. And, and the actor Clark Gregg just does such an amazing job of that. Because because he just seems so sincere. He's like, oh, no, I want you to know it's an, I don't own it. It's it, it's a lease. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I yeah. also have this gun. Do you want that? Yeah. too? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it's it's just brilliant. And, and I think that speaks to also just how smart of a thinker he is, because I think he speaks this way, partly because of how off putting it can be when somebody's kind of absorbing that information. And like the whole thing with the gun, like I feel like, you know, his brain is is spinning so far ahead of these two where he's already kind of put a plan in place. Okay, I'm going to pull my gun out. I'll go into this other aisle. 
I'll slide it across the floor and use that as an opportunity to attack. It, like, I, I just feel like he's such a smart cookie and it just doesn't come across yeah. in um, purposefully in the way that he speaks. Eric Pearson is the the pen behind this short script. Uh, Pearson also wrote The Consultant and Item 47 and Agent Carter, all of the Marvel one shots. He also uh, was an executive story editor on on the TV series Agent Carter and wrote uh, Thor Ragnarok, Black Widow, Godzilla vs. Kong. I think when you look at the the Marvel work he's done and all of the shows that he's been script doctor on all the way through Endgame, uh, he... I think he has a real affinity for this kind of wit in dialogue and makes it easy. And mm. uh, I, I really like I, I really like what he brings to to this and and in establishing Agent Coulson as this character for us to really find an affinity with. I think it's it's yeah. terrific. Well, and I think speaking to that kind of that levity he brings to the scripts, you can see why he also works as a script doctor and was brought on yeah. to Ant-Man, Spider-Man Homecoming. Pacific Rim Uprising, mm, Avengers Infinity yeah. War, Avengers Endgame, Pokemon Detective Pikachu as a script doctor to kind of bump up, I'm guessing, some of that levity. Especially because there's one moment that happens right now that I, I don't know if this was written in or if it's the director, but either way, I think it's brilliant. And it, it's blink if you miss it, but it tells you so much about Coulson, which is that after he's told them about the car and before he tells mm. them about the gun... They both turn their back on him and go back to just focusing on the woman behind the counter because clearly they now think that he is, you know, not a threat in any way. And I remember my first thought when I watched that is, why doesn't he just pull out the gun now and point it at them because he's got both of their backs to him? And then, of course, I the next thought I have is, oh, because if he does that. Now she's going to be in incredible danger. And now there's a standoff and maybe they're going to maybe he could shoot one of them, but they shoot her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, like. Everything in the MCU is so deliberate. I feel like that 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 one moment had to have been deliberately put in there just to show again, like, that's how good Coulson's situational awareness is. He's not just thinking, how do I get the drop on them? He's thinking, I'm going to try this much more dangerous thing because it's probably going to keep her safer. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's absolutely why he does it. Um, because, uh, you know, I think he sees them turn their backs to him with their shotguns and he's like, I have to draw them out, basically. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What better to to draw attention and reduce harm by holding my gun by the the you know by the butt of the gun right. you know, in sort of a uh, the, the way he is holding it is is uh, non threatening and comical for us but also reduces the threat. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, yeah. Smart. And so now, um, as Andy you you alluded to, he he convinces them to uh, let him move over one aisle. So he's now divided the two of them by an aisle. He kind of goes down to the ground to to put give the gun to the other person distracting him and then takes a bag of flour, throws it at the other guy and goes into this kind of cool martial arts thing where he leaps up into the air. And at first, I remember again thinking like, wait, what? he leaps into the air and you think he's about to do some great martial arts kick. But instead, what he actually does is land on the shotgun, kicking it down. So the shot misses. It, yeah, it's funny. It's it's like aggressive physical stuff but it's nothing that i don't think clark gregg could do as an actor yeah. like it feels it's not a stunt for stunts like a, a, a rigorous stunt it just feels really like a, something appropriate that colson would do right now right yeah you jump yeah. jump up off of the the shelf yeah you know and land on the gun push it down it, it totally feels doable and yeah. um it's it's something i could also say you know, I bet Clark Gregg could even do that, right? I'm, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I have no doubt. Yeah, I think that's a funny thing that they do because, again, the slow motion, the way it's done, the little bit of parkour as he kind of jumps off the thing, it makes it look a lot more than it is. And I think this is, I, I don't have all of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. memorized, but I'm pretty sure this is the only, like, slow motion action scene for Coulson himself that we ever get in the MCU. I feel like this I, is just I a, think so. a <laughs> little thing. And then we go back to him mostly shooting guns and giving orders. Yeah, right, right. Well, um, the, the, the stunt person, uh, performer of record is Brian Avery, and he's done a lot of mm -hmm. stunt work with uh, Marvel, in and out of Marvel, uh, you know, 297 credits. But again, maybe he just made it look so good that it, it looks like Coulson did it himself. May, who knows? But it, it really does. It, it, it looks that good. Uh, no disrespect or discredit. All due respect to Brian Avery. Um, mm -hmm. 
the stunt performer on this. Well, and and I mean, just speaking stunts, I mean, there's a reason that you hire like Jeff Pruitt and Zach Hudson, who are the two robbers, yeah. because I mean, they're they're stunt guys. And that's exactly yeah. why you hire people like them. They're not just stunt guys, but they're stunt people who also act. And that's, I think, a strength of this type of performer who can handle carrying a small role like this and actually do the stunt work. And I think that speaks right. very strongly um, to what they're able to do here. Because, I mean, you know, if you're going to take a bag of flour to the face, you know. Yeah, you got to have some. <laughs> you want to make sure you've got the, the, props, the experience, yeah. the practice. Yeah, right. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And, and I will say it, it, it's ridiculous, but it is a great shot of the, the bag of flour hitting him and splitting in slow motion and flour going everywhere. Perfect. Like, I, as someone who is a longtime baker and has spilled a lot of flour, I, I very much you know connected to that moment <laughs> again speaking speaking exactly to the fact that this is probably the only time in the mcu you have a bag of flour in slow-mo getting hit <laughs> hitting someone in the face <laughs> probably true probably true not enough cooking happening in the mcu <laughs> true. We, we need more of that definitely right. true. so so he now he's finished things up he he grabs the pistol out of the hand and pistol whips them both and they're now happily unconscious continuing the mcu idea that you can that there's an exact dial of physical violence you can use to knock people unconscious without ever doing any real harm. <laughs> uh, bugaboo issue of mine. But, uh, and then he just continues to act completely normal. And I love that the store clerk is, she. I mean, she's scared, she's out of breath, but you can tell she's impressed and a little bit like, this is quite a guy. And it, it's just a, it's again, a half second moment, but it's kind of a like, Hey, you know, this Clark Gregg guy, he's he doesn't have the body of a, you know, a Thor or something, but uh, he can get it maybe. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I think there's something about that, that, you know, she's she's so taken with the whole moment and is frozen. I mean, she, she's completely frozen. Like it takes her a long time before she even puts her hands down. But she's kind of so, yeah. so stuck in. I mean, all of this happens in all of, uh, I don't know, five seconds, really, the the actual mm -hmm. attack. And so when something like that happens and it goes from from one thing to another in such a short period of time and i mean she's probably i don't know what she's thinking about colson but there's also the entire uh you know possibility that i i was afraid of these two guys as the threat but now this guy just took them out do i need to be afraid of him as a potential threat like is he going to do anything also, also legitimate yeah. also legitimate but and i think and colson probably knows that and that's why he's so calm and collected and saying you know i couldn't mm -hmm. decide about the donuts hands her the gun with it pointed at him so that you know that's obviously a you know a, mm -hmm. a, a safety safe, yeah, yeah exactly mm -hmm. and i think he just deflects all of the the harm and and the the tension by just kind of talking about the donuts and the money and stuff so do you yeah. do you think yep. though that she has any reference for billy blanks and the hit exercise phenomena, Tai Bo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I feel like at that point in time, Tai Bo was pretty darn popular, if I remember correctly. Yeah, in the 90s. Right? I mean, it, that... Oh, God, I, am I that old? I thought, yeah, I thought it was... The two, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, okay, so it was mass marketed to the public by 1999, an estimated 1.5 million sets of the videos had been sold, frequently uh, aired television infomercials, pop culture phenomena in the 1990s. You okay. know, was it still a thing? In tw in I mean, two, this this is 2010, as we know, according to the MCU 10 years timeline, later. So. I, guess, I, I guess it's possible. She does give him kind of a confused look. And so I could see it being him trying to be hip and mention something totally cool. Like, that's what I would do. I would mention that, oh, yeah, you know, it's just like that song. And people are like, Matthew, that song came out 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah, um, right. you know, so I, I think that right. that's certainly a possibility, too. But but I need to back up just one second, because I know I'm a huge Star Wars fan and I want to see Star Wars in everything I possibly can. <laughs> Am I reading too much into it, though, to hear some a Star Wars reference when he throws her the money after leaving bodies in her business establishment and says, sorry for the mess, exactly the way Han Solo did in the Mos Eisley Cantina? Am, am I reading too much into that, or do you think that's an intentional reference? I like I like believing it's an intentional reference. I also <laughs> really like believing that, that Coulson is also a, a Star Wars fan, like he fashions himself oh. a bit of a Han Solo. You know, Peter Parker will later establish that Star Wars does exist in this yes, universe. So, a hundred percent. Oh, I love the idea that he's intentionally making that reference. Yeah, that that yeah. makes it ten times better. I think Coulson's a fanboy. Yeah, I I, I love that idea, and I'm going to run with it now. 
Yeah. <laughs> Which I, I should say there are all sorts of theories out there that once you know Star Wars exists in the MCU, Samuel Jackson playing Nick Fury just gets into all <laughs> kinds of, you know, what actually happened to Mace Windu when he flew out the window. But that's that's another thing entirely. <laughs> but let's get back to actually an important moment, because I think this actually is very telling about S.H.I.E.L.D., because up till now, we've had the understanding that S.H.I.E.L.D. is... Yeah, kind of like paragovernmental, sort of quasi-legal, but definitely acts as a governmental agency and is interested in the prevention of crime and bad stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, generally, like, you know, if you're an FBI agent, even like a CIA agent, and you do something that the cops are get involved with, you stick around and talk to the cops. And here, like, you know, she asks him, what do I do? What do I tell the police? And not only does he not offer to stay— he flat out tells her to lie, and it's a ridiculous lie that clearly won't fit the facts of the situation, but he gives her no more help as to what this poor part woman's going to do when the cops show up and want to know what the heck happened. Um, it's a funny joke, but I think it is kind of an interesting statement about S.H.I.E.L.D. What do you think we get? What do you think we learn about Coulson and about how S.H.I.E.L.D. interacts with other law enforcement type things by him just being like, I'm out? And when those two criminals wake up, I mean— they're not they're going to say it wasn't her. It was some guy who came in, who was here. Right. And so it's not like right. uh, like her lie would ever really be bought anyway. But Colson doesn't care. Well, no, but my sense of it was that he'll probably contact his shield team as he's driving and say, hey, this just happened. And they'll they'll reach out to the police and kind of sort the whole thing out. They'll send people over there and it will all be squared away and. It won't matter if she tells the truth or lies, because I, my sense is that S.H.I.E.L.D. would already be working behind the scenes to to straighten it all up and take care of the matter. You know, I, I so a slight variation on that theory. My theory is like we have and, and we've already sort of Netflix leaned in on this, right? There's the Danny Rand and the, the Jessica Jones and the Matt Murdock. These are positioned as the street level heroes, right? My take is that S.H.I.E.L.D. is not a street level hero, right? They are doing things that are so much bigger than solving grocery store disputes that this was an act of convenience on Coulson's part because he really just wanted to get his donuts and his gas and get on the road. And he solved this problem. But normally he would not have been the guy to call to solve a problem like this. And he just needed to get back on the road. And he legitimately doesn't care about the fallout at the at the local police report level. He needs to get to this outer space hammer that's just landed in the desert. And so I, I really like for me, that street level hero uh, delineation really helps in this context because it's not his job and he would never respond to it. I think that's true. And I think there's actually the, the kind of connective tissue between what both of you are saying is that either way, as you see it, part of the point is he knows he doesn't have to care. Yeah. There's never a thought to him of, I need to come up with a good cover story yeah. or I need to figure out a way to hide this because, and to me, part of what that says is S.H.I.E.L.D. is a lot more powerful than we think it is. And as you were kind of alluding to, uh, uh, Andy, S.H.I.E.L.D. is very good at covering its own tracks, you know, to the point where he 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 doesn't have to give her a cover story. He can just say, say something ridiculous because, you know, all he has to do is say, you know, hey, control, I got into this altercation at this place. Take care of it. And he knows it'll be taken exactly. care of. And that's that one minute tells us a lot about S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah, I think so. Pretty interesting. Yeah. So he gets back out and finds that he this gas station is one of the slowest pumping fuel <laughs> that we have seen because throughout Desert the entire stations. scene, it was still just pumping gas. And it just finishes just perfectly as he comes out to the car, gets in the car and very secret agent style with the music playing again. He drives off into the into the darkness of the night on his way to New Mexico and Mjolnir. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I, I have a question I, in terms of the marketing of these one shots. Do you ever think that Marvel really got behind the one shots in terms of using and marketing them, m using them to market the films effectively? Because I really think that they missed the boat with with this one in particular. And and I know, you know, the other ones we can have we could have a completely separate conversation. But this one, I feel like taught us something as again, using your word, Matthew, as an Easter egg. Had it been released before Thor? It would have given something for the fans to know about this character before we saw the movie. It gives us a chance to unlock something special 
about our viewing of the movie that others don't get to find out. And I think that's a huge marketing miss to put this after Captain America. I think it's just a it's a miss. Well, it's I think it speaks to them not thinking ahead in this context yet. Right. Mm. I, mean, I think that's that's what I read. Yeah. Well, at a production agency, right, the Eberling Group comes to them and says, we have a chance to do some serious product placement if you can give us some of your uh, some of your characters who at this point were sort of B-level characters uh, in the movie in, in terms of Agent Coulson um, and, and some of the other agents that we have in the other, uh, you know, the consultant. Um, but it, but it gives us a chance to like we could really leverage something if you just let us do this. I, I think you're right. It's definitely a missed opportunity. And to me, it goes to. What has long been my biggest single complaint about the MCU, uh, well, other than maybe the uh, dial of violence of exactly the effect you want it to be, but that I feel like sometimes I wish the MCU trusted its audience more. And what I mean that is, is that obviously they've always had to balance between the people who know the comic books, they're going to do the research, they're going to read everything they can, they're going to seek out these one shots, and the people who are going to walk into a Marvel movie theater, walk out. And then not give a single thought to Marvel until they walk back in. And I get the concern of we don't want to have so many Easter eggs. You know, they don't want to put so much in the one shot that the people who didn't watch the one shot feel like they don't get it. And then people start feeling like, eh, I don't want to fully commit to this MCU thing, so I don't want to watch as much. And I I get that concern. But I just think that there have been so many opportunities over the years where they could have they could have drawn more of that connectivity. You know, things like the, you know, Matt Murdock doing some legal work around Civil War or, you know, Spider-Man showing up in the Defender stuff in any way whatsoever because it's all in New York or just all these different things. And I think you're right, Pete. I think the one shots would have been a really good way to do that kind of thing, you know, and I uh, part of where I'm coming from is I, I've just finished a big re- a big watch of The Bad Batch, the new Star Wars TV show that was on um, it's Star Wars, but it's also Disney. Uh, and we covered it on my my podcast, Star Wars Universe podcast. And that actually did an amazing job of there were so many Easter eggs from the Clone Wars and even from comic books and Star Wars video games. And I was recording the podcast with someone who didn't know any of those things, and he still loved every minute of it. And to me, that's a great example of like, you can trust you. If you do it right, you can trust the audience more. You can have these one shots that give some of us a lot more depth, but that don't, as long as you're careful and they don't reveal anything too major... You could still watch the movie. Like, I don't, I think this helps me better understand Coulson, but I don't feel like I was ever missing anything by not having seen this, you know? And I think that's what Marvel never really fully believed. Well, and of course, watching it after the fact just does exactly what it did. It gives you more of an affinity to this character. I just think it's, I, I file this under Marvel's missed opportunities in terms of, of market. Not that they ever really needed it. I mean, they're, they're doing fine, yeah. but it just seems like this falls as a marketing piece out of place with some of the other promotional uh, efforts. Well, I mean, that they I, mean I think that place. all makes sense because, I mean, look at what they're doing with them now. Nothing. Like, they're not Nothing. on yeah. Disney Plus. Like, why wouldn't Disney Plus say, let's put these out? It'll be a, its own little in the Marvel category. We can have the little one shots listed and people can go watch them. It's like, why aren't they putting them in a place where they're more easily accessible? Yeah. Well, what one fun little fact I thought is, you know, we talked about that that action scene and it was it was a stunt person, but it's, it's something that even like a Clark Gregg could do. Like there weren't any crazy wires. There wasn't any like super CGI of any kind. Mm-hmm. That action scene took up 80% of the total budget for both of these one-shots. Now, also consider, this is part of why I've been harping on the fact that there is a lot of product placement in these two and a half minutes. So you take that, part of what that tells me is Marvel did not put a lot, if 80% of the budget that includes all that product placement went into that action scene that was just basically a guy throwing something and then jumping up and kicking something, that tells me there wasn't a big budget to this. You know, this seems like... Marvel gave like a pittance amount and said, have fun with this, but this is so far below what we care about. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot it in a day, clear out, Mm -hmm. you know, let's get back to work. And I think uh, that makes sense when you see kind of the other one shots. I mean, they actually continue to grow in scope. So, I mean, at least at least they're doing a little more each time. But at the same time, it always it always feels like. As I watch them, I'm like, I, I, I feel like this is the redheaded stepchild. Not nothing, <laughs> nothing against you, but I'm sure you've, uh, I'm sure you've heard it. As a person with a step parent, you know, I got to object. But... 
I'm also a one-legged man, and sometimes I get an ass-kicking contest, so I understand. <laughs> anyway, go on. <laughs> but, I mean, I think that speaks to just exactly all the, the point. I mean, it's just a continuation of this point that it's not something that Marvel was caring enough about. And I think, I don't know, I, my sense is that fans enjoy it and would like to see more of it. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll, we'll see if they ever circle back to it. I'd love, I'd love to see them do it. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, I certainly had a lot of fun getting to dive into this one. It gets me even more excited to see what's going to happen in New Mexico, what's going to happen with Coulson and all these other things. Uh, any other kind of last comments, though, either you want to throw out? I just love the director's name, Abed Abonimus. That's a good name. A.K.A. Latham. Yeah, credited as Latham, but man, I would go by Abed Abonimus <laughs> <laughs> any day of the week. Either one. They're both. They're both yeah, speaking so of, cool. as a guy who also has his name spoken in others' sake and tends to peter out, <laughs> Abed well, Abonimus. Not, well put. Well put. Yeah. I like it. I like it. We all uh, appreciate no, this. You. This was great, and uh, c congratulations, guys, on launching a great season. I'm really excited to uh, ride along with you and and uh, hear what you have to say about Thor. It's going to be fun. Yeah, well, and thank you to you both. It's been, uh, you all have kind of handed me the reins with a huge amount of help to kind of uh, take us through here. I'm really excited. To all you fans, uh, you're probably not used to my voice, but uh, I'm really excited to have this experience with you all going forward to hear your feedback and thoughts if you're members, which is a great thing to sign up for. If you're interested in hearing more of my stuff, you can find me at theethicalpanda.com. I do all my podcasting under that name. I have the Star Wars podcast I mentioned, as well as Superhero Ethics, where I get into a lot of kind of ethical questions of things um, about anything superhero related, comic books, movies, TV, video games, uh, ethics of fandom, all kind of great stuff. And mostly, I'm just uh, really excited to talk about Thor. So to you both, thank you so much for having me as a part of this. To all our fans, thank you so much and have a great day. Until next time, true believers. Marvel Movie Minute is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson. This season's music is One Last Ride by Martin Puringer. Find the show at truestory.fm, and if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, consider doing that for this show. Music